All right, so I'm gonna. So I believe we are live. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Uh, good night, depending on what part of the planet you're in, <laughs> you're on. Uh, but we are joined to, this morning, uh, for me, with Dr. Catherine Pollack, who's uh, the head of Animal Care Southeast Asia for Four Paws International, who graciously offered to give us some of the details of the recent announcement we heard on Friday out of Vietnam. So on December 10th, 2021, Hoi Han, an historic trading port and world heritage site in Vietnam's Quang Nong province, signed a deal with global animal rights group, Four Paws International, to phase out dog and cat meat from the city. This will be the first time in Vietnam that a city takes such comprehensive action to, to end the dog cat meat trade. The two year agreement will begin in late 2021. So I believe it started. <laughs> we are in late 2021, right? <laughs> We are, yeah. Well, you know how things have been going this year. <laughs> uh, absolutely. <laughs> and so right on time, um, it will also improve uh, companion animal welfare through rabies vaccination and sterilization programs and help with preventing further pandemics like the one we're in. So Four Paws has been engaging with the Hoi Han People's Committee for more than a year, following an expression of interest in rabies eradication, improving animal welfare, and promoting its image as a world-class tourism destination. So Mr. Nguyen the Hong, Vice President of a uh, Vice Chairman of Hoi Han City People's Committee, said animal welfare is important to both international and local tourists, especially as companion animals are becoming increasingly seen as family members in Vietnam. So Ho Han, I thought it was interesting, translate as peaceful meeting place. So it is very fitting that this is the first city to actually take a stand against this cruel, inhumane trade and send a powerful message that the Vietnamese people do not condone the eating and slaughtering of our beloved four pod companions. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Pollack, for being with us today. And we're all eager to learn a little bit more about the details of this uh, agreement. Um, so if you wouldn't mind telling us, because this is exciting news, everyone's very you know, happy about uh, the announcement and we're hoping it's gonna translate uh, into other cities taking a similar uh, stand. Um, but can you tell us the behind the scenes work that went into getting this deal, um, this great victory in Vietnam? Yeah, well, first and foremost, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. Um, and I'm, you know, always excited to talk about this topic, particularly when it's about victories. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah, so it's definitely time to celebrate. Um, I mean, so much behind the scenes work, and I'm trying to think about like where to even begin to describe the work that went into this. I guess I'll go back to 2019. Um, you know, we as Four Paws have been involved in Southeast Asia funding a variety of companion animal welfare programs with local partners. Some of those are spay and neuter, some of those are veterinary training. I mean, it just depends on what the need is. And we have two amazing local charity partners in central Vietnam. So shout out to them, Vietnam Cat Welfare in Hoi An and pause for compassion in Da Nang. So they're both, you know, nearby each other, you know, within 30 minutes or so. Okay. Um, and so we started running a, a feline welfare program because there was just, there really wasn't a program like it in Vietnam. And so we focused on cats, um, you know, responsible pet ownership. We were doing spay and neuter clinics, um, et cetera. But the problem is, I mean, this is throughout all of Vietnam, is pet theft is rampant. I mean, it's... <laughs> You know, it, it's kind of, you're not throwing your money away in terms of these programs because of course there is value, right? Like there yeah. is value in terms of public education and awareness, but when thousands of animals are going missing and being stolen and, you know, you're running a hotline essentially, you know, for people that have lost their pets, stolen pets, I mean, you know, it's kind of like enough is enough. And so we started engaging with the Hoi An government um, we knew that they were already doing some rabies control work, as a lot of provinces do in Vietnam. Um, you know, but the issue is that, like, this money is not well invested when these animals are being stolen, traded, killed. Like, 
Okay, yeah, just to clarify, I mean, most people would understand what you're talking about, but these pets are stolen for the meat trade, right? So, yeah, yeah and uh, we've heard, we've all seen uh, posts on social media, you know, of people actually uh, enacting, you know, vigilante, you know, against these uh, yeah. thieves. Um, and so it's a common problem in Vietnam, especially, maybe it's a little bit everywhere in Southeast Asia, it's but... It's, it's, I would say it's particularly rampant in Vietnam, if we look at kind of regionally, not to say the pet theft doesn't happen in other places for slaughter of these animals. Yeah. And in central Vietnam, particularly, people might not associate it so much with the dog and cat meat trade, because when we think about dog and cat meat consumption in Vietnam, we typically think of Hanoi in the northern part of the country. But what's interesting about the cities of Hoi An and Da Nang is you have these holding areas and what I mean by holding areas are these places where hundreds of cats and dogs are kept in very inhumane conditions once they're trapped, once they're caught by the traders, um, they'll be brought to these holding areas, kept there for days, uh, you know, little food, water, certainly no care. And then they're often trafficked, I mean, under very horrific conditions, you know, 24 plus hours to the north of the country where they're, you know, they end up in slaughterhouses and whatnot. So it, it's it's difficult right and it certainly yeah. puts you know the partner charities these local charities in a very tough position like they're trying to do spay neuter and rescue for these cats but then down the street you literally have these horrific areas and we actually funded an investigation um this is back a couple of years ago with our friends at change for animals foundation yeah and into the into the cat meat trade specifically and what we actually found were these commuter buses like passenger buses the equivalent of a greyhound that yeah. were visiting these holding areas loading up the luggage uh holding with cages and cages of cats and dogs and then trafficking them to Haiphong which is about 26 hours Oh my God, and underneath that, the bus with all the gas fumes, like emissions. Yeah, and, well, and you know, I mean, I think the, the shocking part about this as well is you have passengers sitting right above these animals and we actually sent an investigator to do the entire route. And yeah, oh you could God. hear dogs crying, barking. Um, they would be and offloaded people, at different points. And yeah. the passengers are just like nonchalant about it. They're not reacting. They're not well, concerned. Well, I can only comment to the one, the one bus ride that we yeah. sent someone on. And no, there was nobody that, Oh my God! you know, and the bus driver isn't on it, right? I mean, there's certainly bribes being paid along the way. And I'll yeah. say, I will say that we did contact this bus company. I won't name it here, but we did contact them, send them a formal letter. They did say, um, you know, that they were horrified and that they would put in mechanism, you know, in place that oh, you know, this wouldn't happen again. So, yeah. so that's good. Fingers crossed, right? Yeah. Um, but so that's how we how we started the engagement um, with the government, and and really based on their rabies control program. Like we know you're doing a great job at this. How can we help you? And oh, by the way, this <laughs> other thing is happening, right? Yeah. And so, <laughs> it like, might be counterproductive, right? Yeah. Like, so. <laughs> if you want to get the best bang for your buck, like how can we support you? And that yeah. was really how that discussion initiated. Wow. And am I correct in saying that Vietnam, like China, has no animal welfare laws? Or are there some kind of protection laws for animals? That is true. So there is no actual animal welfare, you know, legislation per se. Um, mm. There is, however, an animal health law. Um, okay. And so, you know, the animal health law regulates the prevention, treatment and control of animal disease specifically. Uh. And so, you know, what we do know is that this trafficking of unvaccinated, unquarantined dogs and cats throughout countries and from neighboring countries you know, some of which are much more highly rabies endemic, you know, that is in contravention of this Vietnamese law on animal health, um, and yeah. specific articles in particular. And so, and you know, that's often a campaigning question that we have, like, are we looking to get new legislation enacted? Like, of course, I mean, of course, who wouldn't want a national yeah. law? You know, but that's hard, right? Like just from a sheer campaigning perspective, like I guess the way yeah. the legislative process works in some of these countries, very challenging. Yeah. Or do we focus on getting enforcement, you know, of the laws that are already in place? And, you know, in many of these places, there are very clear laws in which the dog and cat meat trade violates. And so this is kind of an example here yes. of that. I would say the challenge in that, and you're right, and in terms of my conversations with others and a country like China, especially, they said it will never 
be a nationwide ban. Like you have to like focus province by province. And, you know, some yeah. provinces are more, um, you know, quick to, to make that change because they're, there's not a big market for them right. of dogs exactly. and cats and they're more yeah. tourist friendly destinations. So it would, you know, totally. Yeah. And that's why this made sense. This made sense because it was a lower hanging fruit. But, but with that being said, like also just take a step back and that, like, yeah. this was no easy, like, no easy. Oh my like, God, no. Low hanging fruit. But if you look at it, you know, comparatively Vietnam, um, you know, a rampant trade, just in terms of quantitatively, the numbers are just astounding. Um, and, and, you know, we've really seen very little action. I mean, very little. It's can you been tell us about, about the crack. Can, yeah. can you tell us about the numbers? I believe it's about 5 million dogs a year that are slaughtered for their meat. Yeah, I mean, that's a number that's typically quoted. And again, you know, take that with a grain of salt, because this is very difficult to yeah. quantify. We've, we've, we've extrapolated, you know, that number from, you know, the number of animals that we know that are passing through Department of Animal Health checkpoints every day, number of animals that we know that are going to certain slaughterhouses, number mm. of animals, you know, we can multiply, you know, dogs sold per day at the number of restaurants. So like we yeah. try to quantitative, you know, quantify that. So we think, yeah, in the 5 million ish, maybe more. And cats also, you know, again, mm. something that doesn't get talked about a lot and doesn't get the attention that it deserves. And I'm going to keep talking about this, yes. but, but yeah, about a million, at least a million cats. And that is a whole trade in and of itself, oftentimes very separate uh, to that of the yeah. dog. I yeah. think they're touted more for those uh, Gowanji soju, uh, which is like a tonic for women's yeah. health. I mean, it's marketed towards middle-aged women, as I understand it. Uh, but yeah. also, when I had you last on my podcast, and and please, uh, you know, for folks at home that didn't see the podcast we did on Four Paws, it's an amazing show. So much information was shared. It was published March 26, 2021. So go check it out. And I will put uh, the links in the description box below. Um, but when we talked uh, last on that podcast, you told me actually Cat Me was becoming a little bit more favored even by younger, uh, the youth, you know, like younger people, because it, it was seen as like a cool thing to eat with, you know, beer on a Friday night uh, out with their friends, instead of having your typical chicken dinner, it's a little bit more yeah. exotic. So is that yeah. still trend, you know, keep you know, yeah. growing? Well, you know, you know, COVID certainly has thrown a wrench into a lot of <laughs> yeah. trends and behaviors. And I, what I will yeah. say is, you know, a lot of restaurants and general activity has been really restricted. When we look at, you know, Vietnam as a whole, in terms of their approach to COVID, it has been very, you know, militaristic and lock, yeah. very strict lockdowns. Um, but what is sad, kind of the, the flip side to that, so one might think, oh, great, like maybe the trade isn't as rampant, you know, of dogs and cats. Yeah. But we actually sent an investigator out about a month or two ago to meet with some of the holding area owners and some of the local slaughterhouses. And they said business is booming. Never been better. So oh that's boy. Yeah, even kind of COVID couldn't make a change happen. Like that's not enough. What motivation. does it take? Yeah. What does it take? Yeah. Sometimes, but you know, all overall, I want to stay positive. This is an amazing victory. Yeah, totally. Totally. And I'm a little bit curious. Why do you believe Hoi Han of all cities was a little bit more uh, ready and ripe for this change? You know, where, I mean, you've been ta in talks with many different cities, I imagine in Vietnam and, and, and yeah. in fact, you know, people were quick to point out that, you know, um, uh, Hanoi, Hanoi was in talks with Four Paws and they had kind of come to an agreement that they were going to try to phase out the dog cat meat trade from the city. Uh, but that never kind of materialized. And a lot of people are like a little bit cynical about this new announcement. And they're yeah. like, well, is it another Hanoi? But I will say, I don't think Hanoi signed a memorandum of understanding like Hoi Han did. Oh, totally. What I will say about Hanoi is that it was actually nothing that we were really directly involved with. And that was one, I don't want to use the term rogue, but one vice chairman who said, yep, dog meat tarnishing the city. And we're going to have these plans. And I think, you know, my understanding of what happened behind the scenes after he made that announcement was he was you know, slapped on the wrist, like, uh, no, 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 that's not happening. And so we always yeah. say, you know, Hanoi, what happened? But like, 
Yeah, no action, no even action plan. I mean, it was one person making a statement and the media jumped on it. We did get all excited. And, you know, you do want to get excited about these yeah, things. But for sure. Yeah. And so it, it's clear, it, it's totally understandable, like why people would, you know, approach this with a healthy dose of skepticism. And I think what, what really is great about this is how eager actually the Hoi An authorities were I mean, not only for this program, it's going to be two years in duration. We're going to roll it out, you know, with a detailed action plan. It's very comprehensive. Like there's budget behind it. Like this is happening. Yeah. Um, but they were the ones who really wanted to have this big press event. We had Vietnamese celebrities, travel wow. companies. Okay. Um, they were all like, in. <laughs> all in. Yeah. Oh, all in. And they wow. were excited about it. And and this makes sense, right? I mean, again, it is lower hanging fruit if we're looking at quantitatively. This is yeah. not, you know, yes, I would be jumping up and down if this was Hanoi, but I'm still equally as excited about Hoi An because yeah. Hoi An is such an iconic city, you know, in Vietnam, famous for its ancient town. That's a UNESCO World Heritage Site since yes. like 1999. It attracts pre-COVID, millions of international yeah, visitors pre -COVID. And, yeah. <laughs> and domestic visitors. And I think it, it's just, it, it's incredibly exciting. And I think they very much recognize how much, you know, animal welfare matters to, to tourists. And I think, Absolutely. you know, we've also had really great engagement with the tourism industry. Um, and, and, you know, they're certainly influential as well. So I'm, I'm very hopeful about this. And yeah. I think what this does too, is it's gotten such great media attention. It's just been going viral within Vietnam, wow. which is amazing. Yeah. Um, it was on BTV, you know, the most popular, you know, television station today it aired. I mean, it's just been incredible. And so I think it will also just serve as you know, leverage to say, hey, yeah. to Nang, to the North, you know, what yeah, are you doing about look, look at the success they're having, exactly. And so anyone visiting Vietnam, book your, <laughs> book your <laughs> hotel in Hoi Han, let's encourage <laughs> this because, I mean, I think they were very motivated by that because they are a, a very popular tourist destination and this can only help them, right? You know, uh, obviously. 100%. And I think, you know, one of the reasons too, and, and you know, this is certainly, you know, the argument that we very much made because I think I might've talked to you after the CM Reap, you know, passed their provincial yeah. ban in Cambodia to say, look, like your neighbors, you know, they just, and look at all the great media and all the great press. Yes, people are um, applauding that, you know, like yeah, worldwide. So, yeah. Like, you know, and there's some healthy competition um, for historical reasons between the two countries, Cambodia and Vietnam. So, yeah. you know, what if CNU can do it, you know? And so I think they definitely took that on board as well. And again, like one could always say maybe this is lip service, you know, but at the end of the day, like there's a whole lot going on behind the scenes to process these financial, you know, processes and to, uh, you know, create this action plan. And, and it's quite comprehensive. I mean, if I can just share with you for a minute kind of what some of these activities Absolutely. will be you know, over the next few years. So public education, obviously important. Um, so we'll be doing billboards. So we already have secured three like billboard yeah. spaces in like prime locations throughout Hoi An. Um, we're also doing radio shows. And I mean, we still have to figure out exactly what that's going to look like, but they're going to have a representative that's on radio talking about this, you know, because it's wow. important that you know, the public knows about it. Um, we're also going to be doing free sterilization clinics for pet owners, because again, we want this to be like an animal friendly city, right? The tourists are not going to be exposed to animal cruelty. And so we want pets and animals in Hoi well taken care of. Yes. And again, we're well positioned because we have two amazing local partners that we already have programs with. So yes, yes, that's, that's neuter, important. But, yeah, totally. Because there has to be the on the ground capacity, um, you know, mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, too, you know, governments don't have slush funds for these. Types of, and they also might not necessarily have veterinary training. Like, no, able to do no, that that's it. And so I'm curious, like you're forking over the bill like for this, you know, it's going to cost money, uh, all these sterilization programs, spay and neuter. Uh, you know, vaccination, uh, and the city is not really funding any of it. Like you're offering this, like this is your gift yeah, to well, them. I'll say, yeah, what I will say though, is that there is a cost sharing element, right? Because they're using their staff, their facilities, their veterinarians, they're already investing in the rabies control program. You know, they're giving the billboard space, so all of these things. Okay. I mean, yeah, we are funding some of the animal care activities, certainly. Um, but there is a burden of responsibility, <laughs> you know, on and, them as well. And we do have some responsibilities clearly uh, spelled out for them as well. Is that part of the MOU? Because it's a two-year um, agreement. 
yeah. where you're going to take on this initially all of these programs and they're expected to keep them up, you know, after the agreement is. Done. And and not only expect to keep them up, but they're expected to participate, you know, as well. Of course, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they certainly play uh, an integral role in this. And also as part of this support, you know, they're going to also be immediately doing, you know, surveillance, monitoring and enforcement of regulations that are already in place about the dog and cat meat trade, right? So restaurants, yes. holding areas, slaughterhouses. I mean, the good news again, I mean, it's good and bad news. Uh, you know, you want to close as many places as possible, right? But we also know that, you know, this isn't a mecca for the dog meat trade. We know that there's a couple of restaurants. We know there's a holding area. Yeah, um, it was not like a big area. dog cat meat market, but you know, it's like setting an example, setting an that's example. Exactly. And that's, yeah. a, that's the symbolic importance of this. I mean, we do want to get these holding areas shut down. Like absolutely these places are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just, yeah. Being <laughs> a, yeah. Maybe it's a little bit naive of me because, you know, I don't have the experience of working on the grounds in these countries, but uh, I always said, because we know there's a lot of corruption behind the dog cat meat yeah. trade. I mean, the whole trade is illegal in many ways, you know, stolen yeah. pets and it's run by criminal gangs. Um, and so they're happy to pay bribes to officers, you know, authorities, government officials uh, to be able to keep up their business. But I always thought if there's a law and there are fines and you set the fines at a certain level, wouldn't they stand to make even more money by arresting all these people and finding them? And I don't know, like, is that? Yeah, I mean, of no, me? you're totally right. This is a financial driven industry. And I think mm -hmm. it's challenging to people say, oh, this is cultural. Like it's this, it's that. Like at the end of the day, I can tell you, like, these traders are not motivated by cultural values. Uh, no, no, right? not like, at all. Cultural ethics. They're, yeah. This is a profit-driven trade. Absolutely. And I think, yeah, I mean, you have to look at the economics of it as well. And that's also why we generally approach how we have approached it in Cambodia, certainly offering livelihood transition assistance to people, yeah. because this is a people issue more than it is an animal issue at the end of the day. Well, at the end of the day, like, these people, it's their livelihood. They don't... Yeah they they lack education they're it's not like rich people that are highly educated that are doing this involvement yeah. in trade it's really people that have very little options maybe and so i often get the argument well it's their culture yeah of course it's you know maybe culturally speaking at one point in time yes it was more uh, prevalent in Southeast Asia to eat dogs and cats for whatever reason. I mean, I know I covered China and China uh, was very poor and there were a lot of famines. So understandably, even though those periods, other parts of the world were eating dogs and cats as well. You know, like in Europe, uh, post-war, uh, dogs and cats were on the menu. Like it's not like specific yeah. to Southeast Asia, but it's, I don't believe it's part of their culture because I've spoken at length with, you know, uh, local Chinese, and for example, if we're, we're talking about China, um, and it's not part of their staples, you know, it's yeah. dogs and cats are not part of the traditional Chinese cuisine. So, um, so enough with that argument, I think we can do yeah. away with it. It's, and, you know, torture is also not culture. I mean, we've yeah. said it many times. It's cruel. It's inhumane. And it's not just a question of them eating dogs and cats because they, they are poor, because poor people often cannot even afford the dogs and cats. Because um, I, don't, I don't know about Vietnam. We can talk about that. But I know in South Korea, uh, dog meat is more expensive than chicken. Uh, so it's not for the poor. It's, I mean, these are not the reasons why there's still a dog cat me trade. Uh, yeah, totally. And I think, you know, one of the other important points as well as we've done a lot of, you know, public opinion polling. I know this has been done in many places. And yeah, you know, we did a public opinion poll in February of, you know, earlier this year. And this was done throughout Vietnam, Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh City, Da Nang. Um, and actually, you know, less than 10% of people said that dog meat is part of Vietnamese culture, which I think is very interesting. You know, this is Vietnamese sentiment. And we had 88% of people say that they agreed or strongly agreed in that they would be in support of a ban on this okay. trade. 90% would support a government imposed ban. And the strongest support was among 15 to 29 year olds. Um, and, oh. and I think what's really interesting also is that, you know, we've launched a petition as you know, everyone and their mother has at some point. Yes. And um, we had 1.3 million people sign it. Um, and wow. over 200,000 of those were Vietnamese. 
Oh my God, that is really but encouraging. It's really interesting. Coming from an organization that's mostly pushing this in Europe and North America, yes, yes. see like that type of grassroots momentum. Like I think that speaks volumes. And so that's a good point because, you know, often people get discouraged signing petitions or like, what is it really doing? And, you know, I've had some pros and cons, you know, talk, discuss on the podcast, but I, I will always sign it because it's something easy to do. I mean, obviously there's some trusted sides, there's some less trusted sides, but yeah. a petition like yours coming from an international global animal rights group, like Four Paws, I would definitely sign because you can present it and it, it does have some weight, you know, when you're, oh, you're discussing this with uh, those governments because the world is watching, right? And no one wants to have a bad reputation in the eyes of the international community, especially a, a city like Hoi Han that depends greatly on tourism dollars. So, you know, this is encouraging them. So please do sign the petitions, especially the ones from Four Paws. And, you know, I know Soya Dog also puts out petitions. These are good petitions to sign and definitely put your name on that uh, because it does, you know, carry its its weight. And like you said, you know, some often the, the signatures come from local uh, people. And so if we're going to talk about this poll that I read up, uh, uh, you know, like you just mentioned, 80 percent were supporting a ban. And it was um, the poll was uh, surveyed with 600 Vietnamese. Right. Um, right. What, when was this poll done and what year was it recent? It was done earlier this year. So it's fairly recent. We did the one year before in Cambodia and then in Vietnam um, earlier wow. this year. So and was are... it like a nationwide survey or was it specific to a certain region like Hoi Han? Well, obviously all of these, you know, can be done in very different ways. Um, so the market research agency that we use targeted three cities to get a representative sampling so that was uh you know respondees in Hoi, in excuse me not hoi an in hanoi in da nang yeah. in the central part of the country oh, wow. and in Ho Chi Minh city and um how does this poll compare like the results how did they compare to other polls uh, four pulse has done like i know that you've done it in cambodia um yeah. i don't know if you've done it in indonesia and other parts but uh how does it compare is it like much better results or like yeah well yeah, I mean, it's, you know, some some parts of these surveys are more promising than others. Um, you know, I was there on the ground. This is, was actually pre-COVID when, you know, we've done a couple of different types of polls. We've done market research, like consumer sentiment. Um, and then we've done more like, what do you think about legislation type polling? Um, yeah, it was interesting. I think in in Cambodia, it felt a bit uh like harder to get, you know, certainly behavior change, like the yeah. market research company, I remember but, you know, the guy that was in charge of the survey spun his chair around and was like, <laughs> you guys have your work out for you because <laughs> um, there he was wasn't a not too encouraging <laughs> that we're going to make them stop. You know, but oh again, you know, in, in Vietnam, I think what's interesting, too, is if you look at just the percentage of consumption, when like you start there as a baseline. So we yeah. have some really good data from Vietnam, Cambodia, Indonesia. So we're talking about Southeast Asia here. And we look at, well, how does consumption compare? You know, in yeah. Indonesia, and it kind of makes sense being a Muslim country where dog meat is considered haram, um, you know, consumption is about, you know, 4.5%. This is really new kind wow. of market research that was done by the Dog Meat Free Indonesia Coalition. That's even less than what we used to think. We used to say, you know, 8%. Um, okay. In Cambodia, quite a bit higher, about 12% are regular consumers. And then Vietnam sits right in the middle. So Vietnam, about 6.3%. That's, if you think about it though, that's like a really small number, right? Like yeah. six out of a hundred, I guess you could argue, you know, one out of a hundred is too many. But like, when you look at the majority, I mean, that if you look at it, you know, the other way, um, that's 94% yeah. of people. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that don't eat it regularly. I mean, I, I don't know yeah, how, yeah. how specific the questions were on in that poll, but you know, like China, often people say it's like about 10% of the population that consumes it regularly. Right. And so we're not talking about someone that goes to a, a function or, 
some kind of conference yeah. and dog meat is being served and they eat it once a, in a while, yeah. uh, not intentionally buying dog meat. Uh, but 10% of a, you know, you know, 1.4 billion, I think yeah. they are. So I yeah, mean, it, it still yeah. gives way to big numbers. But so Vietnam is kind of in the middle, like between Cambodia being high, but it's a smaller country, of course. Yeah. And then Indonesia and Indonesia, I know it's very famous for this Tomahan, uh, you know, uh, extreme yeah. market that they call it. It's like a is it an animal market or is it just like a wet market that sell all sorts of things, including obviously dogs, live yeah. dogs? And- yeah, I've had the pleasure of <laughs> um, seeing this firsthand. So, yeah, no, it is just a general market. And I think what was interesting, it was often, you know, touted on TripAdvisor, like, you know, must be oh, like yes. Thank traditional God. market. I and think, uh, they took that down. I think TripAdvisor. Yeah, advisor- that was taken down. Yeah, yeah. that was taken down. Um, but it's still horrific. It's actually something we you know, it's the Dog Meat Free Indonesia Coalition is investigating now. Yeah. Um, this this Because when we say extreme markets, I think that's where they blow, uh, they burn, they put dogs in cages and, and set them on fire. Or, I mean, that's what I had uh, come to to hear. Like, I don't know if it's exaggerated, but. Uh, um, yeah, so how it works without going into, <laughs> into too much detail. Yeah, yeah the dogs are, are taken out of the cage, like with a noose and they're hit over the head once or twice and then they're set on fire. Yeah. Uh, well, Not I mean, often that they're, they're still alive, obviously you can hear them scream. And so it's yeah. really, really horrific. Okay. So we've got this great victory in Vietnam and, um, <laughs> yeah, I thought we were keeping it positive. <laughs> yeah, no, I absolutely so sorry. <laughs> I got a little That's bit okay. lost, but you know, in terms of us, you know, because I, especially for my podcast, most viewers are American, Canadian, maybe like me and in the UK predominantly, those are, yep. I, I would say US and UK are the biggest countries that are, you know, like fighting this dog cat meat train. Um, there's a lot of support out there. There's a lot of groups, a lot of, you know, a presence of activists. There's a lot of nonprofits also based in those countries. <clears throat> so you know, as we as foreigners, we're always like, feel like, what can I do to support your, the work in those countries? And so obviously I'm always quick to say, put your money where your mouth is. You know, when you see a four paws achieve such victories, because we can talk about Siem Reap, which was a huge victory for you in Cambodia, that province has a rat, you know, has banned the dog cat meat trade because of the work that you've done. And so the best way to support this kind of work is obviously to donate because this, these kind of programs uh, don't come cheap. I mean, they're very expensive. Uh, and without donations, uh, they can't, you know, you can't do the work. And so for me, that's the easiest way to help. Um, but Obviously, there are other things that we can do for those, for whatever reason, that can't donate. And I'm always curious, what would you say? Is it like writing letters to our local ambassadors or or is it, you know, setting a letter campaign to, I mean, I would assume a letter campaign from foreigners to those governments. I don't think that would uh, be so successful or. Yeah, I mean. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean. I like your idea of monetary donations, of course, because these do take money, right? At the end of the day, we have amazing local teams that are doing yeah. a lot of work again behind the scenes. I mean, in Cambodia, a good inst- a good example is, um, you know, we had to set up yeah. an adoption center with for dogs because, you know, the government started intercepting yeah. dogs and like, you know, and so that takes money to operate. So of course, like that, Absolutely. you know, I can say certainly if you donate to Four Paws, that money will be put to great use. Um, Exactly. We we also have, um, if you do sign the four pause petition and you get on kind of our our listserv on this issue, we do have from time to time, like calls to action on how supporters can get involved. Um, You know, for instance, recently we had, I'm not integrally, you know, involved in our tourism campaign. We have a whole separate team that works on that. Um, but they're actually engaging with, you know, corporate you know, tourism agencies and having people write letters um, either to their embassies or to certain, you know, tourism um, bodies so that we can get the tourism industries to start, you know, putting pressure on a yeah. bag and whatnot. So, you know, and then sometimes we will have calls for engaging with embassies. Um, so it kind of just depends. But if you get involved, you know, in our 
you know, kind of listserv a network, then we have, um, yeah, actions. Like for instance, oh, yeah, now. that's true. I mean, it's easy. You just go on Four Paws website and there's often, obviously, obviously some yeah. call to actions, campaign letters that you can participate in. It's already set up for you. Like totally. one click and you can send it. And 100%. so, and so yeah. actually we had over 24,000 people. So these are supporters from around the world that were able to write to the Vietnamese, Cambodian, Indonesian tours and boards earlier this year to express their concerns about the dog and cat meat trade. And right. you don't actually have to be like, dear and bad, you know, no, 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 no. we have it all set up. Yeah, exactly. A- like you just type your name and then the letters populated are exactly. and- auto generated. And we do make sure that those do get to those relevant, you know, exactly. bodies people, so yeah. And I, I think that it go it does go a long way. Yeah. Wow. And so are you able to tell us a little bit more what's in the works of with Four Paws, like any other programs or projects in the works that you can talk yeah. about? Well, I mean, we're, we're busy, right? Um, yeah, you, know, you got really your good. work so cut I, out for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so our focus is generally, you know, Vietnam, uh, Cambodian, Indonesia through mostly through, you know, Dog Meat Free Indonesia Coalition. Um, I can say, you know, in Indonesia, a lot of exciting things happen. You might have seen the recent uh, interception in central Java. Yeah, like the first ever, you know, right outside the slaughterhouse, um, wow. the animals were intercepted. They're doing amazing. Um, Can you actually tell us a little bit more? Was Four Paws involved in that? I know there's um, Dog Meat Free Indonesia coalitions, like a coalition of many yeah. groups. Yeah, so it's a it's a coalition activity. So we are a member of Dog Meat Free Indonesia, along with HSI, Humane Society International, yeah. along with Animals Asia, and then we have two amazing local groups as well: Animal Friends Jogja and Jakarta Animal Aid Network. Yeah. So you know, this is an all hands on. Yeah, like. And how did that come about? Like, how were you able to confiscate those dogs and? Uh... Like, yeah, I mean, so this came about largely because of meetings, you know, that the Dog Me Free Indonesia Coalition had, um, and particularly in, um, you know, central Java, there was actually, you know, a workshop and we had planned to do, you know, veterinary training, you know, with this province. Um, Four Paws actually has an animal welfare online program that this government also was, you know, has been interested in using and, you know, certainly, um, Lola Weber actually from, you know, HSI could speak more directly, you know, with more accuracy about this, but um, yeah. kind of the, the month before, you know, in, in Kulong Prongo district is where this is in central Java, there was a trader that was caught and sentenced to 10 months in jail and got a fine of about 10,000 US dollars. And this was really, and he was trafficking around 78, 80 dogs, something like but, that. But what was yeah. the fine based on? Because they don't have animal right laws or like, what was the what was the I, I suspect that it's probably arbitrary, you know, what, what the fines are in these situations, but it was yeah. really huge because this was the first time, you know, that we had actually seen like a legal, yeah, like ramifications. Um, and so that was the beginning of kind of this cooperation. And it was actually at the request of the police. They knew about this kind of kingpin trader that was trafficking, you know, also probably involved in other illegal activities as you mentioned, um, okay. many, which often overlaps with this trade. Um, and so there was kind of a, a sting operation set up by DMFI. Okay. With the so they arrested team. him not so much about the dog trafficking, but it was related to other illegal well, activities? I think, I think that was dog trafficking. I mean, that was clearly because of the trafficking of dogs, which is really exciting. Yeah, is it illegal? It's illegal in Indonesia to traffic dogs? So so it's very similar in some ways to Vietnam, where you have legislation about animal health, about the trafficking right. of diseased animals, things of that nature. Um, yeah. But what we have been seeing is really kind of a domino effect, similar also back up to what you were saying about how you know national bans are not only really difficult, but sometimes they don't they're not actually enforced province to province yeah. because some of these governments are very kind of deregulized. De- yeah. Right, that a word decentralized, I think is the word. Sorry. That yeah. I'm looking for. And so the, the provinces, regencies, cities, and sometimes even villages, if you look at Bali, for instance, like the yes. village chief has the say, has the, like the final say, it doesn't wow. matter what the national okay. law is. It's like this okay. village chief. And wow. Indonesia is very much like that. And so even though uh, there has been great progress with getting the national government to say, look, like this is clearly not legal. They issued a directive. 
to yeah. you know all of the regencies within Indonesia, but like that didn't really translate into action. Um, okay. And so what we've been seeing in Central Java is incredibly exciting, right? Like the arrest, prosecution, and then the sting operation. The trader was arrested. The slaughterhouse owner is under surveillance, and you know that operation is no longer wow. um, you know working. And again, it's one of those things where we hope that this will have a trickle down effect um, yeah. that we can engage with more and more provinces as it becomes you know, more celebrated. So a lot and, of exciting things happening in Indonesia. And is right that now. traitor in prison? Like what is the, what are the consequences of? Yeah, the, the traitor, I, I'm not sure the sentencing has occurred, but that traitor was arrested. Yeah. Mm, so, and yeah. all of the dogs are, yeah, doing great. Uh, and the I think they're open. coming to Canada. I'm so excited because I'm a volunteer for HSI here in Canada. And because, um, you know, I think most people at home probably heard, but the Central uh, Center for Disease Control in the U.S. put a ban on the import of canines. And we're not sure how long it's going to last. It's been in place since uh, July 14th of 2021. And so all these nonprofits that rescued dogs in those countries had no outlet, you know, like no way to yeah. bring these dogs for adoption in the US. And so they've all turned to Canada. And I'm, I'm very happy about this, of course. Um, you know, like, welcome. I can tell you Canadian officials don't share your no, don't I'm share sure. your excitement. Uh, but I'm hoping they're not going to put in a similar ban, but I don't think so. Like, I think, uh, you know, especially uh, well-known organizations like Four Paws, you know, HSI, every dog cannot fly unless they're, you know, fully vaccinated. They've had all their health certificates in place. It's more of a concern. That, I mean, the, the reason why the ban was put in place in the U.S. is because of not like nonprofits like yours. It's because of, you know, some illegal uh, puppy mill breeders and, yeah. and uh, I think Eastern Europe you know, Russia, that part of the world that were yeah. bringing puppies uh, below age of vaccination and they, they were sick. And this caused concern because, you know, we don't want rabies. Obviously, rabies is deadly. And um, this is another reason why these governments are a little bit more motivated to ban the dog cat meat trade because it's directly related to the rabies spread. And yeah, you know, I think that's part of your your talks uh, with those governments is to say if you want to rad eradicate rabies, you gotta nick this uh, industry and you know, like put 100%. an end to it. Yeah, a hundred percent. To me, it's it's a clear like it's it's a pretty clear relationship. <laughs> like uh, yeah, you're not going to achieve herd immunity when all millions of dogs are being stolen and slaughtered. Um, we are actually in Vietnam and, and we've done this before, um, but we'll be engaging again in doing rabies testing. Um, because again, I think you just have to keep nailing this point, you know, hitting this point home saying, there's dogs that are entering this trade and they are rabies positive. You know, and this is putting so many people at risk, right? The traders, yeah. people catching the dogs, people butchering the dogs, potential consumers, people in yeah. markets, slaughterhouse workers. It's, this is an issue. It, yeah. it is a big issue in Southeast Asia. Human rabies is actually a big problem. And so this is great leverage for you, you know, guys to kind of negotiate with those governments and to enforce it. Because often, like you said, a law is a law, but unless it's enforced, it's not going to do much uh, headway into, you know, eradicating this trade. And I think part of the, the issues that you were bringing up earlier is that you're paying your funding for all these, you know, vaccination programs but it's going to do no good if those same dogs are being stolen and used in the dog meat trade you know and, so. and that's what happens yeah. right i mean it's terrible i mean and yeah. this is really why four paws got involved in this campaign because i would say just you know out of, you know organizationally speaking we're kind of late to the game just in terms of the number of years that we've right. been involved in this but it was because we set up all of these programs and then the dogs were going missing or people were calling and, you know, my dog was stolen. And it was like, well, this doesn't seem necessarily like the best investment. No, I know. That's yeah. it. Like, so this this is truly a victory in the Hoi Han. And we're really hoping, what would you say, like the nearby cities, uh, the next one, I think you mentioned uh, that might actually enact a similar ban is. Well, I mean, I can't say with certainty, but I would say Danang, you know, Danang. you're definitely on our on our list. This is another up and coming city in Vietnam. And I mean, maybe speak a bit more pre-COVID um, 
just because of how severe the situation has been. But yeah. pre-COVID, very beach-like, almost like a Phuket, Thailand. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like really, and you know, great place. We have local partner doing, again, incredible work. So that capacity is there. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, yeah. these, these other smaller cities, very touristy cities, but I mean, you know, why not go big or go home? Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh City, now is your time as well. So if you're watching yes. this, <laughs> you'll be well, getting a letter. Yes, please do. Um, but like you said, I think uh, it came about, uh, about because, you know, these traders that are involved in dog cat meet you, they're very powerful and they yeah. have a lot of influence. And, you know, this is their bread and butter. And if you're hurting their business, they will retaliate. I think there's a lot of fear out there uh, yeah. about that I would assume um, but you know uh, let's just focus on you know what we've achieved here with four paws I mean this is amazing and I would encourage everyone at home to go visit your website follow you can subscribe to your newsletter you be you can be alerted when there's a call to action like this and sign the the, the petitions it's really important i mean look at what we've achieved you know with the help of obviously the great team at four paws but i mean putting your signature on a piece of paper and saying listen we stand against this and the world is watching and we want you to, to take action. Totally, obviously. totally. And, you know, there's never been a better time now when, you know, kind of hard to appreciate if you're sitting at home in the U.S. or Canada. There are strict international travel bans throughout all of Southeast Asia. Like Absolutely. there's still no travel. Thailand just started opening up the borders, but Cambodia, Vietnam, most of Indonesia closed, specifically Vietnam closed. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, not even like any dates for reopening potentially. So like, why not take action now? Right. Like, you know, there's going to be countries vying for tourists to come yeah, back. Yeah, exactly. Like, so now's this is the a real time. Win. Like kudos to Hoi An because yeah. We'll be rec recommending tens of thousands of people oh, to yeah. go there. That was something I thought of. And, you know, let me know if it's a good idea. But I thought it would be great for us to express our, you know, appreciation of what Hawaii totally. has accomplished. And I'm sure like we can probably post a message or send, you know, our emails to the city officials Tag on social media, a hundred percent. It's a great idea. And it's something we'll, you know, this is very new, right? This was as yeah. a Friday. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I know, I know. <laughs> but, but it's a really good point. Yeah. And, and we do want to make sure that they get the kudos. I mean, I, I think it's just been incredible seeing even, you know, VTV, which is government state run uh, TV programs, just having it all over, you know, wow. really celebrating the heck out of this. So that really says a lot as well about the, like the national sentiment. So, OK, so yeah. are you able to share with us those emails? I mean, uh, you know, or we Google ourselves or are you planning to put out some kind of letter that we can send? Uh, easily? I think we'll, we'll plan on that. I think that's certainly in the discussions, a, yeah. a discussion point for next week. So I'll definitely keep you posted as we. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. when step. we sign a petition asking, you know, for stuff. Well, then when they do it, you know, you got to. Thank totally. Them, right? like, yeah, absolutely. It, it makes perfect sense to me. And so I guess, you know, we'll leave it there uh, for today. If anyone, I, I don't know if anyone's up this early. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know how, That's us. <laughs> you know, it is the weekend, but, you know, yeah. I'll check it out in case uh, somebody's posting questions because we do want to yeah. respond. Okay. Yeah, okay. Jada, let's do that. I will send. Okay. I, I think Molly Sweeney is one of my friends on Facebook. So hi, Molly. So nice for you to join us. Oh, and Christina as well. So I think everyone's eager to send their letters to congratulate awesome. Hoi Han yeah, let's and, do it. and thank them. So yeah, do um, stay tuned because we'll be uh, posting that uh, very soon and all the links and you know, let's, let's just celebrate our victories because I always say I'm a part of an animal rights, uh, you know, group here in my local city of Montreal. And I always say like there was a, you know, Canada goose victory, you know, Canada goose yeah. is a, you know, uh, winter, I mean, all, all sorts of, you know, out of wear, uh, producer in Canada from Canada. And they were, they recently announced that they were going to ban fur from their operations. 
But, you know, people are like quick to say, but what about the down? And I feel bad for the geese, you know, because they're going to continue. Yeah. As far as I know, they're going to continue using geese and their coats. But you got to take the victory when it comes and celebrate that and then push for further change. But let's not forget, because it's if not, we're going to be so depressed, you know, like you got to celebrate the victories when you have them. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. It is so easy to sit back and be critical. Like yeah. Any, I can be critical. Yeah, <laughs> like, we can all be critical, but you know, I, I embrace the victories when they come, I think is the message totally. I want to send. And you know, it's okay to be cynical. It's okay to have a little bit of skepticism that's healthy, but you know, do embrace and let's applaud uh, Hoi Han because I think, uh, they've done a great thing here and uh, we're going to send all our, you know, tours dollars there. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know what? This was a great day, a big victory for Vietnam's cats and dogs. Yeah. Yay. And I just say, let's just build on the momentum, you know, from yeah. here. and many more to come. So we'll keep following you, uh, totally. Dr. Polak and Four Paws and keeping abreast of all these developments and changes. And thank you. Totally. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>